All right, I want to welcome everybody to the History of Aviation podcast after a little slight hiatus, but we are definitely back. My name is Derek Beeler, and always I'm joined by Mr. David Rowe and Dave Gorman. How you guys doing? Starting with you, David Rowe. Oh, I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. Uh, just a lot of rain and uh, bad weather here lately, so not a lot of spotting going on. But uh, on the good side, I've got my daughter home from uh, college for Christmas break, and my son comes home uh, this weekend. So we'll have a full house, and it'll start getting exciting around here very soon. How about you, Dave? I'm doing really well. We're coming into the home stretch right before our winter holiday break so the kids are a little anxious about all that some of the teachers might be as well things are going pretty well we we sure hated all that rain it uh it really got in the way of us being able to do some outside things at school of course the kids have been squirrely but uh the sunshine was nice today we'll take it things are good though very good that's great to hear guys great to see you guys again and jump into this thing right quick we are today is a big one because it's a big one around Knoxville, East Tennessee area. We're talking about the KC-135. I'm going to turn you guys loose, starting with you, Dave Gorman. Well, once again, yeah, as you say, the skies over East Tennessee, uh, it seems like there's always a 135 or two up in the uh, up in the air. And lately, sometimes we get lucky, we get some variants uh, of this airframe, which um, has uh, some long legs. It's been around for 60 years or so. And uh, I, I find it fascinating how many different varieties of, of this family aircraft are uh, still in use. Some have been retired, some have passed through and are in storage or you know, no, no longer a mission that exists anymore. But it's, um, it, it, it's a beautiful, beautiful aircraft and just great to see. So uh, looking forward to hearing what we come up with on this one. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, it is a regular visitor over the Tri Cities. Uh, we've got a uh, a couple of refueling routes that run right by. Uh, I'm in Bristol, Tennessee, and there's one that runs from up in uh, Southwest Virginia, right down into the Tri Cities, and then they turn around and they go right back up into Southwest Virginia. So, I get them to the left of me. I get them to the right of me uh, at least a couple of times a week, and depending on weather. Uh, you never know what you're going to see them. I've seen them with J stars, C 17s and C five galaxies. And it's always a treat when the, you see them coming, you get out there and you start shooting some pictures and see what they're pulling along with them. I, I can remember the first time I ever saw an air to air refueling live. And I, I had gone back to school to become a teacher. I was walking on campus at the university of Tennessee in the year 2000. And for some reason, I looked up. I didn't hear it. It was probably at 15,000 feet or something over Knoxville. And I looked up and just saw this, uh, the, the outline of the 135. And it was, it was refueling something that was in similar size. So it might have been a, a joint stars or something like that. But uh, I couldn't believe it, that I could actually see it from the ground. It was kind of a, you know, um, a surprise to me because I, I, there was no tracking uh, hardware that I was aware of that you could, uh, websites, anything like that, that you could actually follow those things. And I was amazed that you could see it. And of course, now it's something that such a regular thing to see, and we know when it's coming and we can quickly and easily figure out what it is that, uh, that they're, uh, refueling. It's always fun, but it, it, you know, it, it was so cool to be able to see that from the ground. And now we've got, you know, the ability to reach out and get close with, uh, with big lenses and they, they put on quite a show for us. Well, no doubt, and they uh, and because they're based in Knoxville with the one thirty fourth Air Refueling Wing, you know, if you're out at the airport, you'll watch them doing touch and goes, and can get up close and see and hear them, and uh, they're very impressive for a really old bird. Uh, they put on a good show. They circle around and fly right over your head. And as a matter of fact, at, at one time I was at McGee Tyson, and one comes screaming in and banked really hard. And I've got photos of vapor coming off the top wing of a KC-135, just like a fighter plane. It was amazing to see, you know, it pulled so hard it could pull vapor out of the air. You got to believe that the uh, crew on that plane were feeling good about that, too. And my gosh, I hope they saw your video, or your pictures of it, because they were like, yes, that's us. 
<laughs> As a matter of fact, one of the uh, people on the plane contacted me a few days after I posted the picture and said, hey, I was on that flight. Can you send me the picture? So, yes, they did see the pictures. Pulling vapor on a 135. Who'd have thunk it? <laughs> Not me, that's for sure, because I'm taking the pictures and I'm like, is that what I'm seeing? And so get you know, look up on the little screen on your, your camera and you're like, well, dang, there is actual vapor on that. So yeah, kind of a neat thing for a four engine, big heavy to, to do in front of you. Absolutely. Well, and we've got um, the National Guard here at McGee Tyson that, that, that operates these aircraft. And, and some of those are, uh, there are 135s that are active Air Force and then uh, 135s that are in the Guard uh, service. And, um, you know, we're lucky in that we see visitors that come through from other bases as well. And I know that there's a pretty active group of folks locally trying to get pictures of uh, aircraft coming from Grissom or coming out of New York or, you know, far away bases that, that stop in and do their training and spend some time with us. So. Yeah, it's, it's uh, really neat to, you know, they attract that kind of a, of uh, attention uh so yeah there's you know about 300 and what i see about 400 active duty and about 250 national guard so there's a lot of kc-135s that you know after 65 years they're still out there uh they outnumber any other uh refueling plane by a lot and uh so you uh you figure you know they've been around 65 years how much longer can they go uh 2030 2040 is the projected life of these birds and they're still working hard every day that's going to put them close to 80 years of service for that airframe exactly yeah it, uh, you know from a 1950s design and it's still the main workhorse of the uh the refueling air you know air refueling and of course they've updated avionics and the, the engine that was a big change when they uh they uh, added these uh newer bigger engines on them uh Range obviously is is typically not a problem when you're a refueling aircraft, but um, they've participated in missions around the globe, and and you know it feels good to know that uh, this prof these professional airmen are up there um, pumping the gas and and keeping keeping uh, keeping the missions going and and taking care of business round the clock. Oh yeah, that's uh, exactly. They're on alert all the time because there's aircraft in the air all the time. And as long as there's aircraft flying, they're going to need gas uh, because, you know, they, the air force needs an unlimited reach to get everywhere in the world. And the tanker is the platform that allows them to do that. Uh, you were talking about the engines. Uh, they started out with these uh, Pratt and Whitney turbojets, And, uh, you know, that was typical of the 1950s. And these things are loud, they're smoky, they burn a lot of fuel. And so in the 80s, they switched over to uh, these uh, uh, GE high bypass turbofans, and uh, they went 25% more fuel efficient. Uh, they could uh, offload 50% more fuel because they were so fuel efficient, they weren't burning their own fuel, so they could give it away to the receivers. And uh, the bigger thing is they're 96% quieter than those old turbojets. So when they uh, take off, they're, they're a whisper compared to what they started out. Seems kind of hard to believe, but, you know, I'm not, I don't guess there are any uh, of the, uh, the old engined aircraft that are still, um, still plying their trade anymore because for all those reasons you just suggested. But, um, you know, one of the things I enjoy about being this close to, to uh, our wing out here at McGee Tyson is these aircraft have, uh, you know, obviously different call signs and everything like that, but many of them have their own nose art. And uh, it's really cool to see the variety of pictures on the uh, the Tennessee Air Show's Facebook page that people are getting of, of the nose art. One of the most popular ones, of course, honors East Tennessee icon Dolly Parton. And, <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, it's, uh, people get thrilled when they get get a get a good shot of Dolly coming in. Well, they even advertised that uh, Smoky Mountain Air Show you had last year. That was on the nose of one of those uh, 135s for a while to promote the air show. So, I mean, it's it's got multiple uses. It's an impressive aircraft. Um, 
And it, it replaced the KC-97 that we had here in Knoxville that, uh, way before my time. Some of our listeners I know have seen and can remember seeing the 97s when they were active out here. But the uh, the big uh, four-prop uh, uh, refueler could barely uh, barely get it going fast enough to refuel some of the fast movers in the Air Force inventory. So uh, it's, you know, writing was on the wall, of course. And I think they left us. Did they were they still flying the net 97s locally into the 70s, Dave? I don't believe they were. I think they got rid of those in the 60s. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it's, it's funny because I'm sure there was a time when they thought that, that the 135s are going to pass through. And, and there are other aircraft that uh, have come on since the 135 that, that do that job and, and other mission parameters and everything like that. But, but there's no sign of us not needing the 135. It fills an important role. Exactly. The, you know, the other aircraft, the, uh, the KC 46 Pegasus and the KC 10 extender, uh, they've literally only built about 60 frames of both of those. So that's only about 120 compared to the, you know, 500, 700 KC 135s that have been out there. So, you know, without the 135s, uh, the Air Force doesn't move around the way they want to. And uh, the next, you know, what's coming in the future, uh, uh, these uh, KC uh, Y and KC Z uh, planned, uh, you know, clean sheet versions are, are in the works, but they're not coming anytime soon. And that's another reason why, you know, we're going to see this 135 flying into the 2040s, possibly later, if they don't get something on the started building soon. Well, I'm going to brag a little bit here. Um, I have actually had a flight on a KC-135 out of McGee Tyson. It was an in-service I took years ago through uh, University of Tennessee and aerospace uh, course that they had through the local wing of the Civil Air Patrol. And part of the training, this was for educators who might use aviation in the classrooms. Part of our classroom experience was a uh, orientation flight on a 135. I didn't care what they called it. Okay, I was going to fly in a 135. And so I got to do that. And um, earlier classes had flown a 135 down to the uh, to Kennedy Space Center, landed on you know the, the shuttle runway. Other groups had flown off the coast of uh, Florida and refueled F-22s. I, I would have been okay with any of those things, but frankly, it didn't matter what we got to do. We ended up, we ended up flying a refueling track up over Norris Lake and over Anderson County um, and refueled a uh, E-8, the, uh, the Joint Stars. One came up out of uh, Georgia and joined up with us, and they practiced their, uh, their hookups and uh, releases. And of course, we were flying a, a race course trek uh, for, I don't know, maybe an hour, hour and a half or something like that. And to see an aircraft just as big as you come in that tight uh, is a real testament to the professionalism of the of the air crews. Of course, um, I was freaking out. I was filming it. And we, we got to go back where the uh, boom uh, operator was and uh, watch that whole process. And they were just total pros. But I mean, you could look right down through his window and see the uh, easily see the crew of of the joint stars coming in and, and hooking up and pulling back and dropping off, dropping back, maybe, I don't know, a quarter mile or something and then coming back in. It was, it was quite a thrill. So uh, that was kind of neat because that was about 10 years after I first saw a hookup looking up over my head at the university of Tennessee. And then I actually got to see it from inside the plane. Quite a treat. Oh yeah. Must uh, great memories right there. Uh, so the the boom operator, he's laying down in the floor. Is that correct? He absolutely is. He has a uh, kind of a mesh hammock type of thing, that, if I remember correctly, and a joystick that he was controlling it with, if I remember. Um, the whole thing was, was just, you know, I'm taking it all in um, and watching that. But we also were able to go up to the flight station uh, up, up in the cockpit and watch that and see the, uh, the settings that they locked in basically on autopilot yes with their again the racetrack um route that they were running and everything but the the boom guy was laying down back there i think nowadays and uh, some of the more recent the uh the the pegasus and 
probably the, the KC-10 uh, refueler. I think they're sitting upright and they've got, you know, a little bit more, um, maybe a more manageable posture that they're in when they're refueling. But the, the 135 has a, the guy laying down in the back. Yeah, it's it's amazing that that plane only requires three people to do its job: pilot, co-pilot, and the boomer, the boom operator. Well, I and kept that, offering to do something, and they said, "Go away." So, <laughs> <laughs> go take some more pictures. Let me do anything. I did plenty of that, and uh, my our, our friend Bruce Kawakami will uh, he teases me about some of my other experiences and says, "Well, unless there are pictures, it didn't happen." And this one, I had pictures and videos, so. There, take that, Bruce. That that definitely sounds like a fun. I, I would love to do that. It's quite a thrill, and and uh, I would I I would love to figure out how to make that happen again. Well, when you do, you let us know, and we'll be standing in line with you. <laughs> I'll tag hey, you. Yeah. The Is that good enough? <laughs> yeah, that no. that'll work too. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. I like it. Not quite. <laughs> Uh, one of the interesting things about uh, the boom, you were talking about them, you know, hooking up and, and unhooking is that boom operator is actually flying the boom. Uh, the boom of the KC-135 has a, a pair of V-tailed wings. And so he literally flies it in to the receiving aircraft and uh, and makes the hookup, which is pretty amazing. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like a video game. You get that joystick out and you start going left, right, up and down and make the hookup. Uh, the, the boom itself is like 12 feet long, uh, and it extends out, uh, it weighs like 800 pounds. So it's not a small, thin, you know, piece of machinery. It's pretty heavy and it's got a five inch diameter, uh, hole in it to transfer the fuel. Uh, it can do a thousand gallons of fuel a minute and, uh, to do it like an F-16, it takes five minutes to refuel an F-16 and then it's on its way. Uh, and obviously the J stars or any of the larger aircraft C-17s, it would take much larger, longer because they have much larger tanks, but I mean, it, it can refuel a thousand gallons a minute. That's a lot of fuel transferring, uh, from plane to plane. Uh, and as a matter of fact, speaking of the fuel on the tanker, uh, the 135 has 10 tanks. It has three in each wing three in the lower deck and one in the upper deck uh, near the tail. So it is literally from end to end filled with fuel. Does its job and does it well. Thank goodness it's up there. Um, one of the variants that I thought was so interesting was the, uh, the SR-71, uh, which had that special fuel, the high flashpoint fuel and everything. And, and, uh, they had a, a uh, version of the 135 that, that carried just their fuel uh, because you know, obviously it was special. It was, um, it was, uh, they didn't want to get it mixed up with, you know, nobody else could come up and, and refuel off of it or anything. Um, I forget the model number of that, of the 135 that was, that, that it's had a that Q stuff. model. The Q. Okay. Yeah. It was the Q and it's JP seven fuel. I believe is what the, what I read. Goodness. So yeah, it was specially just for them, and uh, I think they've been remodified back to the standard R now uh, since the seventy one's been retired. So uh, yeah, that that would have been a special job though to see a SR seventy one pulling up behind. Uh, uh, the one thirty five also has uh, some passenger carrying capabilities, correct? Yeah, it sure does. Uh, the upper deck. Uh, it is open and it that's another thing kc k is for fuel c is for cargo so kc 135 uh at uh, the upper deck is for cargo carrying capabilities it can carry about 80 passengers at a time and uh i'm trying to remember exactly how much capacity uh i can't recall off the top of my head now uh but anyway Yes, it does. it's a cargo carrying. It does long haul. Uh, one of the things I read is uh, when it's refueling, it can fly for about 15, uh, 1,500 miles uh, with about 150,000 uh, pounds of fuel to transfer to aircraft. If it's just doing a transit uh, flying from place to place, it can fly almost 11,000 miles. 
minutes just using the internal fuel. So yes, it can fly a long way on all that fuel carrying cargo all around the world. Very long legs. I know um, we have some friends locally, and uh, one of uh, one of our friends serves with the with the local unit. And uh, Brandon traveled to Guam um, in the summertime and and uh, flew out there in a one thirty five. And uh, unfortunately, uh, fortunately for our country, but unfortunately for him, he was uh, he was there during the air show, so he he was not able to to see our local air show. He was. Uh, he was out on Guam serving his country, but they flew out there in a 135. And when they came back, I, I saw some pictures, quite a celebration when they, when they returned. Uh, it's probably, you know, not, uh, not like airline food and uh, all the comfort of commercial aircraft, but uh, you know, it gets you there and gets you back. So. Correct. Yeah. It's, it's not a uh, passenger jet. It's not for comfort. It's for, for service. And, uh, but yes, there's seats inside the, I've, uh, as a matter of fact, I walked around in one, uh, KC-135 at, uh, Thunder Over Michigan this year. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of room up there, a lot of space to put people in. And, and, uh, uh, I think it's about 80,000, uh, pounds of cargo that it can carry. So, you know, not a small amount, but, uh, it's quite capable of, you know, carrying the cargo and refueling at the same time. So, uh. Are there any other countries that fly the 135? Uh, yes. Uh, obviously, the United States, uh, Chile, France, Turkey, and Singapore is uh, the ones that I saw that are actually using it. Uh, the REF has their own uh, tanker, the Voyager, which is based on a an Airbus uh, design. So they don't use it. But uh, these others have... Have it in their inventory. Not a not a British plane based on a British design, right? <laughs> no, I'm afraid not. not. <laughs> there are there are Airbus people over there. That's that is correct. That's you know they like their Airbuses. I I can remember when I first became aware of some of these more exotic um, variants, the ones that are used for intelligence uh, collection. Um, back in. Uh, the early eighties um there was a uh shoot down nineteen eighty three of a korean seven o seven which is you know very similar aircraft sized and everything and designed by boeing as well related air aircraft that was shot down by the soviet union this korean aircraft was was flying a commercial flight and was shot down by the Soviet Union who incorrectly thought it was a a spy plane they thought it was a um an American spy intelligence gathering aircraft and, and a horrible, tragic misunderstanding. Um, everybody on board was killed over 200 people. <clears throat> and um, so, you know, a, uh, a sad mistaken identity case there, but I know that again, there are some other aircraft. Um, the reason that the Soviets may have misunderstood it was because there are aircraft of that size and of that, uh, that layout that were used for uh, intelli intelligence gathered. Do you remember some of those, Dave? Yeah, as, as a matter of fact, I've, I've got a couple of them here. The uh, EC-135, which is the looking glass platform. Uh, it's an airborne command post. Uh, the NC-135, which was a test platform. Apparently, they used it for a lot of different uh, testing situations. Uh, the OC-135 which is the open skies bird uh, that was for the open skies treaty where you would fly over Russia and make sure that they were disposing of the materials and, and planes that they were supposed to be getting rid of. And the Russians did the same thing. They would fly over the United States and confirm that we were doing the same thing. Uh, so uh, that was the OC-135, the RC-135, which was the reconnaissance version. The uh, WC-135, the Constant Phoenix, and this one's interesting because it's a nuclear sniffer. It flies around looking for nuclear residue in the atmosphere to determine if somebody has, you know, exploded a nuclear bomb. And we want to know who's doing it and why they're doing it and what they're doing with it. Uh, so, you know, those are uh, several. Now, here's the most interesting one that I found. 
Uh, this one is called the NKC-135R with the nickname Mr. Freeze. It's based at Edwards Air Force Base. And its job was to fly through Area 51, Groom Lake, or the Air Force Testing uh, Center area. And it would perform icing tests on mystery aircraft that the Air, uh, Air Force had up. So literally, the boom on that 135 was adapted to spray water onto a trailing aircraft to test the icing on the aircraft and how it would respond to icing. And uh, it could also do a refueling as well. They, I assume they swapped booms out or maybe they had the same boom that could do both jobs. I'm not entirely sure on that. I've got to do some more research. <laughs> but uh, that was something that was I had never even heard of, that they spray water from a KC-135 onto an airplane trailing to test the icing capabilities of the, you know, if it's Area 51, then obviously we're not seeing whatever it is they're spraying on. Goodness. Well, you know, it's it's funny because airmen are, you know, proud of the missions that they serve. I wonder if there's some interesting mission patches that came out of that aircraft, you know, <laughs> nicknames that they might have had or. Yeah, that would be that. something to see yeah, on somebody's arm. Well, one of the ones that I remember hearing about was called the Speckled Trout. Do you remember seeing anything about that plane? Uh, no, I didn't come across that one. The Speckled Trout was a, uh, it was a, a 135 variant that was used for. Um, uh, weather reconnaissance to begin with, but then it was uh, overseas transportation for Air Force Chiefs of Staff. And so it wasn't a, a really exotic type of uh, name, but it was kind of a, a mission or anything, but you know, certainly important. If you're an Air Force Chief of Staff, you want to ride in comfort and everything. And the crew took what they did very seriously, but actually worked with somebody who had a cousin who I believe he was a crew chief on the speckled trout. And he was telling me all about it. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, why do they call it that? And I was disappointed to see that it didn't have pictures. Or it, did, it wasn't painted up like a, like, you know, a shiny iridescent trout or anything like that, but apparently it was uh, named for a freckle faced secretary whose last name was trout. And so they called her the speckled trout and she was in that office. So they, they, uh, they honored her with that nickname. I don't know how she felt about it, but uh, kind of a neat thing as well. Yeah, um, that's news to me. I'll have to look that one up as well. Was not aware of it. Trout, yep. That's definitely an interesting one. Well, guys, jumping into uh, closing statements here, uh, starting with you, David Gorman. Well, as always, um, you know, I, I love the variety of aircraft we talk about. This is one that um, I'm used to seeing. I've lived in Knoxville since 1988 and was thrilled to realize, because when I moved here, I didn't realize we had uh, this wing of aircraft at, at the airport, was thrilled to realize that they're local. Uh, I look up every time. I watch them every time. Uh, sometimes when I'm driving, I see one pass over and I'm like, okay, in about three seconds, his gear is going down and his gear comes down. You know, I mean, it's, it's a routine thing. Having those big, long runways means lots of practice time for these guys. And, um, uh, you know, being able to look up and, and see them flying their missions, knowing that I've been on one of them before, uh, it's just, it's a favorite. And, um, you know, hats off to the, the guys that work so hard to, and, and women, of course, who work so hard to, to, to uh, keep aircraft in the air. Um, and this service is not glamorous, but boy, oh boy, it's essential. And uh, they they pump a lot besides gas. They pump a lot into the local economy. And, um, you know, I, I know there are lots of kids that look up as well. And they're like, what is that? What is that? And, um, it's it's fun to see, fun, fun to uh, learn about. And uh, I, I, it's one of one of my favorite uh, things to see in the sky over Knoxville. So. Well, and, you know, for me personally working, I work at McGee Tyson Airport. I don't work for McGee Tyson Airport. I work for a, a rental car company there, but we're right there. I mean, I get to see everything coming in, everything coming out. And I can, my area of the airport is blocked by the Hilton. You can't really see the runways or anything, but I can always hear the KC-135 and I, I know what's happening. So it's definitely it's definitely a favorite around here, and it, you, you know even even being 
around the Maryville Alcoa area. You see them all. That, my drive home, I seen two just this afternoon. Closing statements for you, David Rowe. Uh, yeah, it's a wonderful bird. It's got a long life. So we've, uh, it's been here longer than we have. Uh, it's, and it'll stay here for a good while. Uh, the cruise, they just call it the tanker. It's simple. It does a, its job very well. It's capable. And, uh, I, I was reading one of the airmen saying that, uh, nobody kicks ass without tanker gas. And that pretty much says it all right there. That, that is a great thing. Yeah, that's a great statement. Go ahead, Dave. I was just saying they're proud of their job and, and uh, thank God they're up there doing it for us because um, it, it keeps, it keeps the mission moving along. You got to have it. Definitely. Absolutely. For, a- absolutely. Salute to all you tanker crew people. We appreciate you. Thank you for the show that you give us constantly in the skies over East Tennessee. Oh yeah, for sure. So I'm going to close things up, guys. I want to thank everybody for listening. I want to thank you guys for joining us as always. So for Dave Gorman, David Rowe, I'm Derek Beeler. Thanks for listening to the History of Aviation Podcast.